and welcome to episode number 24 of CS350 Online. I'm your host as always, Leslie Eisted, and in today's episode, we are going to do our final wrap-up of the whole course. And I want to apologize to you in advance that if my internet suddenly goes out and the stream suddenly dies and I don't come back, it's because I went downstairs and um, my, ba my basement sink was full of spiders and my husband thought it would be a good way to kill them using a torch, like, like fire. So if I lose my internet, it's because my house burned down. <laughs> I, I wish I was joking. <laughs> All right. Just again, a couple things to remind you of. Don't forget that the page table bonus is due on April 14th, which I guess would be tomorrow. So if you're going to submit the page table bonus, even if you've submitted it with A3, please resubmit for tomorrow. And um, the other thing to remind you about is that the quizzes are all due tomorrow as well. And then shortly thereafter, the final assessment will become available. And just to give you a little bit of details about that in advance, it's going to be another quiz on Learn. There's somewhere between 60 and 70 questions, and that probably seems really intimidating, but I think you get three or four hours to do it. And I think you get two attempts if memory serves me and we take the highest attempt. And a lot of it's going to be things like true, false, and multiple choice. And then there'll be a few computation-based questions as well. And for when it comes to computation questions, you might be wondering, well, how many decimal places of precision do I need to put? Don't worry about that too, too much because I understand that, um, you know, there's precision errors and some devices might calculate things slightly differently than others, even though they're not supposed to. Um, so we actually have an epsilon built in. So if you are within a certain range, you'll still get the full points for it. So don't worry too much about um, how many decimals of precision do you actually need. We, we've got a little epsilon there. And uh, I mean, I don't think the final exam is exam is is too bad um, we if you have questions during it please reach out to an instructor directly um, or make a private post on Piazza and we will try to address those as quickly as possible the questions tend to be a bit better curated than the quizzes. We've been working on curating the quiz questions and, you know, pruning ones or fixing ones that are a little ambiguous, which we learn throughout the term. And as I've mentioned before, we've been having significant problems with learn because we'll fix a lot of the problems that you've been seeing are questions that we've actually either completely removed from the problem set or we've repaired. And for some reason, learn keeps the old one around and we can't figure out how to delete the old version even though we say we're deleting it, but the final exam doesn't have any of those issues. We've actually managed to keep it in good condition, and we are obviously still trying to fix the problem for the quizzes. And if you ran into any of those problems for the quizzes, it's our goal, obviously, to make sure that they are fixed for your grades, because we want your grades to be as fair as possible. And um, if I see a little bit more, we may even give a few extra marks just to say, look, we're apologizing. Um, everybody gets X more marks for this quiz just because we're going to assume you ended up with one of the questions that was supposedly fixed but learn unfixed. Um, but if anything like that happens, we'll post that to Piazza so just so you know. Because we don't, it's not fair to you. Um, and we want to make sure that the grades are actually fair, obviously. All right. But as I said, the final assessment um, actually is in much better condition. We haven't had these issues with it. And I, again, I don't know why this is. I really don't. Um, so what are we going to be looking at today? So today we're going to talk about um, how to design an operating system. Because we've talked about a lot of the different components of an operating system. And we've talked about them from kind of a high level perspective. But one thing that we haven't really given you any insight into is if you wanted to sit down at your computer right now and design a new OS, how would you kind of go about designing and creating that new OS? So we're going to talk about some of the different considerations, and then we're going to use the OS of the day to actually talk about um, why they may have made some of the decisions that they did. So we'll start with the OS of the day, and then we'll talk again more later about the OS of the day as well. So on that note, the OS of the day... <laughs> is Temple OS, which many of you may have heard of. 
um, may be in interesting context. This is an operating system that was released in 2013 by someone named Terry Davis, who has now um, passed. Um, my understanding was maybe it was a year, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, he was hit by a train while he was walking down the railroad tracks. And it wasn't clear whether that was an accident or it was on purpose, but this individual has now passed. Um, I don't really recommend you look into this individual so much. He used to make a lot of YouTube posts which were removed so shortly before his death from YouTube, but others have actually brought them back. But he's a pretty offensive individual and the YouTube videos, it's my understanding, he offends pretty much everybody. So I wouldn't recommend you necessarily look this individual up. The reason why we're talking about Temple OS though is because it has some very interesting quirks when it comes to OS design, but kind of reflect upon all of the different topics that we've talked about throughout this term. So I thought um, it would be interesting from a technical perspective to look at this OS. So the story, by the way, behind Temple OS, and I don't think anyone will ever know the truth, um, is that Terry Davis was a manic individual. Um, and at one point in his life, he was an atheist. And I'm not sure if it while he was institutionalized or, or other, he believes that God came to him in a dream and told him to make uh, an operating system that would be God's official temple. So that's kind of the story of where this OS came from. And as we look at this OS, you'll see there's a lot of things that kind of reflect back on biblical themes. But it's interesting because the, the technical details are very different. And they have very interesting consequences in OS design, which is why we're talking about this. So there is uh, the rules that were supposedly dictated to him um, in the dream were that the screen had to be 640 by 480. So you're looking at an old VGA style screen. That's what I grew up with. Actually, I grew up with CGA, but uh, 16 colors and one audio voice. Now, why only one audio voice? That is, again, coming back to the biblical theme of this is God's temple. So there should only be one voice and that it was the voice of God. At least that is the story. Um, there is no network because why would you need to talk to anybody else? Um, now, this is where things get really technically interesting, because I don't really think that this is that interesting. Um, this is These first two points are really just saying this is, an, this is an operating system from the early 80s, even though it was released in 2013. So where things get interesting is the fact that there is one address space. One address space. So we've kind of talked about how every process has its own address space. And we do that to keep processes isolated from each other. So if you do something bad in one process, it doesn't affect the other process. That's not how things work in Temple OS. There is one address space. So processes can actually directly communicate with each other. And obviously, there are some pretty serious side effects to having processes share an address space, good and bad. And another really interesting technical detail of Temple OS is that everything runs with kernel privilege. Think about this. This is an interesting technical decision because if everything is running with kernel privilege, then there's no system calls. And as you know, or I hope you know from watching, from doing process management yourself, system calls can be quite costly and they happen quite frequently. So having everything in kernel privilege has some obvious benefits, but it also has some obvious downsides as well. Now you might be thinking that this kind of operating system doesn't have any modern features at all, but it has, it's concurrent with multi-core support. It does preemptive concurrency. It's, it's modern in uh, many ways, but it just has some very interesting design decisions. Now it is a very limited operating system. Obviously you can't go and get Photoshop CS whatever it is now, um, for it. It uh, looks very much like a Commodore uh, 64 based environment. Um, it has its own file system called the Red Sea, because you need part of the Red Sea. Um, and it was written in his own version of C, which is interesting in itself. And I I looked into this a while ago and it's, it's a very odd variant of C, but it's called uh, Holy C. And you're welcome to look that up because it has some interesting language decisions in there too. And it's open source. So this is actually one of the other cool things is if you want to see what an operating system looks like that's made some seriously different technical decisions, you can actually download the source code to this. I think it's like 120,000 lines. It's not that big. Um, so it's kind of fun, fun to 
to look at. Now I know you probably are like 120,000 lines. Isn't that big? No, it's really not that big. <laughs> I mean, it's bigger than OS 161, but it's, it's not that bad. And this is what it looks like here. So um, you've got a little bit of uh, your access to your file system over here. And then this is kind of like your menu, all the different applications. Um, and then at the bottom, you can actually see different things like what the kernel is doing, like what memory is being used right now and, and stuff like that. It's kind of like a little log. So it's, kind of, it's, it's very technically interesting. And we're going to talk more about why this is a technically interesting operating system a bit later. So what I want to do then is our official stuff for today. And I will get these posted to um, Piazza for anyone who's interested in them. But today what we're going to talk about is how to actually design an operating system. And there's lots of things that we have to actually take into consideration in order to do this. It's not that simple as to sit, just sit down and start writing. Because you really have to ask yourself, what kinds of programs are going to be running on this operating system? And in order to know what kinds of programs that are going to run, you need to ask yourself, who are the people who are going to be using this operating system? Because maybe you're trying to develop an operating system for individuals who maybe are visually impaired. That's going to significantly impact a lot of the design decisions you make about the operating system because that means that the types of programs that are going to be running may need to be adjusted. Or maybe you're trying to make uh, an operating system for developers, people who are just writing code, and so you are going to place your focus on certain other elements. You also have to ask, um, when thinking about what kinds of programs you're going to run, you have to say how many users are going to be using. Is this a single person operating system or is there the potential for multiple people to be using at the same time? So is this a multi-user or a single user OS? And on that same note, does security matter? And probably if you have a single user use case, then security probably doesn't matter as much as the case where you have multiple users using the same machine. And that, again, is something you need to take into consideration. And then there are some other questions that you have to ask yourself, like, do you care about performance? For example, if I am writing an operating system for developers, I actually don't care about performance generally. I mean, I want compilation to be very quick, but other than that, I don't care too much. However, if I'm writing like an operating system for gamers, so people playing first person shooters, performance, excuse me, really, really matters. And even the far spectrum of that, if I'm developing a real time operating system for a car, performance matters even more because I don't want to run over the people who are crossing the street. And you also have to ask, you know, will it be attached to a network? So that's a hardware decision. And that comes back to one of the biggest things that you have to decide, which is on what type of hardware are you going to be running this operating system? Because not all hardware supports all things. And that is going to place some early restrictions on the design of your OS. So let's go into a little bit greater detail on some of these topics. And we're going to start by talking about the hardware because the hardware can dictate a, a lot of the later decisions. A lot of the other higher level things can be dictated by what your hardware is capable of. So you have to ask yourself, if you are developing an OS, what architecture does your OS run on? Are you only supporting a singular architecture or are you trying to make a portable operating system that's going to support multiple architectures? That's a really interesting question. OS 161 was designed and developed to run on a singular architecture, and that is the MIPS R3000. And if you look through the MIPS, the OS 161's code as you have over this term, you will notice that at no point do we ever have any like preprocessor macros that are like saying, okay, use this code if we compiled for PowerPC or use this code if we compiled for a different CPU. 
And if you open up the source to the Linux kernel, and, and I have it somewhere here on my computer. Not exactly sure where at this point. Um, let's see if I can find it here. There's Linux master. So if you actually look, in Linux kernel code, you're actually going to see um, a lot of areas where we it has things specific to the architecture. So I'm going to open Mutex, and I think this has what I'm talking about in it. Um, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> of course, I pick a file that doesn't actually have this in it. But a lot of the files, if you look in the Linux kernel code, actually do have, um, oh, it's the spin lock I wanted to look in. Lock is much higher level. Never mind. Okay. Spin lock. So if we look into the spin lock implementation, you'll actually see there are some preprocessor directives in here where we have these if defs if we've defined certain configuration flags and then then actually add this code to the kernel the reason why you see this is because not every architecture supports all of these different features and so if you're compiling a linux kernel for a particular architecture only some of these config flags will actually be set and therefore only certain kinds of spin lock functionality will actually get implemented and added to the kernel. So this is actually, if you are making a portable operating system that supports multiple architectures, you're actually going to see a lot of this, a lot of preprocessor directives where configuring the, the compile is going to set what you're compiling for right now and that's going to enable and disable different parts of the kernel. This has some interesting side effects though. So if you're supporting a singular architecture like the MIPS R3000 or ARM, this really makes your implementation simpler because if you look at OS 161, we don't really have many of those preprocessor directives. And the ones that we do have are simply, you know, enabling and disabling certain assignments or UW specific features. So the code is really easy to read and really easy to maintain. And it's actually quite small and we don't have a lot of repeated things. Um, but the side effects are this is not a portable uh, OS. And if you know there's huge changes between the R3000 and the R4000, then we may actually have to rewrite significant parts of the OS in order to go from one chip to another chip, even in the same branch of chips. So it's not very portable. And um, if you do want it to have a longevity, maintaining for longevity is going to be a bit more difficult. Um, however, maintaining just for that CPU is actually going to be quite straightforward. Um, I've said here, you know, the OS is going to live and die by that architecture. And that's because you've literally hard coded the specifics of that architecture into the OS's code. Now, the side effects, of course, of supporting multiple architectures, you saw with the spin lock implementation in the Linux kernel that because there are so many different architectures that support different levels of features for things like spin locks. Um, we have the spin lock file and, and I didn't see how many lines were in it, but it's, it's huge. Like when I think of a spin implementation of spin lock functions, I don't think of a file that is like 400 lines long. Spin lock is, should be something very simple. Except because we have to consider all these different architectures, our code ends up blowing up in size. And that's not a very nice thing. So if you actually look at the Linux kernel code, its size is actually really big simply because we've had to support so many different architectures. So your implementation is significantly more complex. Um, and it's much more complex to maintain but it's also more portable. Um, 
which is a nice, which means that it has the possibility for a, a longevity. So it can last a lot longer because we already have kind of that portability built in. So if we want to add another architecture or update an existing architecture, it's already there and we can fix it fairly straightforward. But the implementation in general is significantly more complex. And if you've ever tried to read through kernel code, it, it is, it, it's a mouthful. It's, it's quite a mouthful to read through. So once you've chosen kind of your architecture, one of the things that you need to then choose from there is, are you actually going to perform any abstractions in your operating system? Now we've talked about it throughout this course as if this is a requirement that you must abstract devices and you must abstract uh, the file system. Well, the file system is the abstraction of how data is stored on disk. And you must abstract the execution of programs as processes and threads. And you must use virtual memory. It's actually not a requirement. You don't have to do that. And if you go back in time, a lot of operating systems, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, didn't do abstractions of all of these things. But there were consequences. For example, if you didn't offer a file system, then, and you didn't have an I.O. library, then every single one of your user programs would actually have to manually figure out how to read and write from the disk. And that's going to cause some logistical nightmares. And you come back to the days of the Atari, where the Atari didn't provide game developers with a dev kit, and then each game manufacturer had to write their own driver for the joystick, and their own driver for the screen, and their own driver for the sound system. And what you ended up having is some companies were really successful at getting their drivers to work, and so the games worked really well, and others didn't actually work that well. So the people who created E.T., uh, which is a huge flop of a game, it didn't work out for a variety of reasons, a hardware and a software reason. So providing those abstractions, you don't have to do it, but you probably should. And if you are going to offer them, which ones are you going to offer? So another thing to consider is how is your operating system going to be organized? So, and this kind of comes into the discussion of abstraction because even if you are going to do, offer things like file systems, even if you're going to um, abstract the execution of programs as processes and threads, even if you're going to abstract physical memory into virtual memory, it's, there's more to it than that. Is, are those abstractions going to be implemented and handled by the kernel or are they going to be user processes? So this comes down to the discussion of are you creating a monolithic kernel or a micro kernel? And just to jog your memory on what those two words mean, monolithic is the traditional operating system that you have used probably your whole life. It's what Windows is, it's what the majority of new Linux operating systems are, and Mac OS. It is everything in the kitchen sink goes into the kernel. And then there's uh, microkernel operating systems where the bare minimum goes into the kernel and everything that could be pushed to a user program is. And an example of a microkernel OS is actually QNX. So they've actually pushed things like um, handling exceptions is actually done as like not in the kernel. It's actually, they, they have some basic IPC and they have interrupt forwarding. It's kind of weird, but this is a huge design decision because it's going to impact how you implement those abstractions and it's going to impact your design of the kernel. So if you go for monolithic, this is actually fairly straightforward to do. It's what we do in OS 161. Everything runs in the kernel and you handle kernel calls with system, you do system calls constantly. So this is going to give you greater control over the system and device behaviors because the kernel can actually handle that. But the code base is going to be significantly larger because all of the device drivers are now probably going to be a part of the kernel or at least loadable kernel modules. And if you look at operating systems like the Linux, like the Linux kernel, or if you look at the Mac OS kernel, if you look at Windows source code, there are billions of lines of code each. And what's interesting is the majority of the code is actually device drivers that they're providing to you. So it actually creates this huge bloated program, but you have ultimate control in it. Now, um, 
And that does make things really difficult to debug and, and so on and so forth. But a microkernel, you may have a little less control over system implementation. Um, and because things are living outside of user land, you might end up having uh, bug issues. But some really good advantages of a microkernel are you would choose a microkernel operating system if you needed a really small code base because you wanted to use have an embedded OS. Now, what is an embedded OS? An embedded OS is an operating system that resides on a chip in hardware. So for example, you might have an embedded OS on a Raspberry Pi board. That doesn't mean it, you don't have an SSD plugged in that it's booting from. The OS is actually on one of the chips on the board. And then what's interesting is the first Macintosh computers actually had their operating systems, for the most part, embedded on a chip. And the reason why they did that is because they wanted it to be really fast. And of course, if um, your operating system lives on a chip because you don't have to involve secondary storage, um, it is going to be significantly faster because it's closer to the CPU. So there are some advantages to microkernel operating systems in that they can be embedded. And embedded applications are pretty useful these days. The other question you have to ask, and this again is really a big part of the design of your OS, is is it going to be real time or not? Now, we talk about operating systems as being real time programs, and then we further designate some OS as being real time and others as not. If you're making a regular operating system that isn't real time, you would make it like OS 161. You don't need to place any guarantees on anything about how long a thread is going to take to respond to an event. However, if you're making a real-time OS, you need to design your kernel in such a way that you are guaranteeing that when an event arises, Thread will respond within a guaranteed amount of time. So this is going to affect things like your scheduling quantum, and it's also going to affect things like your implementation of condition variables, your implementation of locks. There's so many interesting things that it's going to be affected if you make a real-time OS. Your scheduling algorithm will be different because you need to make sure that events happen and they get responded to by the owning the thread that was waiting on them in a very quick turnaround time. So there's very, very interesting consequences to that. Then you have to ask yourself, so those are some very low level decisions, like what abstractions, is this monolithic or micro, and is this real time or not? Then kind of above that, we can start asking ourselves, once we've made those decisions, we can say, are we going to support multiprocessing and multithreading or not? And if we are going to support multiprocessing, how are we going to support that? Some of the old ways of supporting multiprocessing were to have a maximum number of supported processes. And you would one of the ways that this was usually achieved was by taking the available amount of RAM and just dividing it into K pieces. And so since there are only K pieces, only K programs could technically run. Um, that has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. One of the advantages here is that if you are fixing the number of processes that can run based on the amount of free memory you have, then you can do address space preloading like OS 161, which is going to have uh, no page faults, and so we don't have to go to secondary storage to get address space. So it's going to be a little bit faster that way, but the downside is fewer processes can run at any point in time. Another question you have is, are you going to be able to reuse PIDs? So how are you going to handle wait and exit? Uh, at what point can a PID be reused, or do you have an infinite counter? If you have an infinite counter, obviously we're going to run into running out of space if this OS is going to run for any appreciable amount of time. So that's something that you have to consider. Um, and then what process management calls are you going to support? So do you offer process synchronization, things like wait PID and exit? How are you going to implement wait PID? Because this is actually a huge thing. How do you implement wait PID? We only talked about wait PID under the context of each process has a singular thread. But what happens if processes have multiple threads? How does wait PID work then? Is it only the thread that called wait PID that blocks? Or do we force all of the threads of the process to block for that wait PID. And that gets really interesting. And if you actually look online about um, some of the different implementations of wait PID, this can actually be very system dependent. So it's, it's, it's really interesting things to think about. Um, 
the other so synchronization when you're supporting uh, process management that's a really big one and another thing is can your processes have multiple threads and if you are offering multiple threads per process how do you actually um, how are you going to handle that because there's lots of different ways um, are you going to actually offer the user program some threading system calls? So right now, OS 161, the reason why your user processes were restricted to a singular thread is because we actually don't have any functions like thread fork available to the user programs. There's no system calls for that. So we are restricted. But if we do we want to offer those calls? Because if we do, we'll have to add some system calls. We'll have to make sure that we do that. Another thing we have to ask is, are we going to support inner process communication? And if we are, what are the different techniques that we are going to support? Is there go are we going to force the user to use files or networking? Or are we going to have some kernel supported messaging um, platform or shared memory that system calls will help us set up and, and manage uh, synchronization through? And the other conversation about threading is, how are you actually going to implement the concurrency? Are you going to do true preemptive time sharing? What will your quantum be? Well, that really depends on your scheduling algorithm. And the other thing is, if you're not going to do preemptive concurrency, are you going to do cooperative concurrency? Because for the record, I mean, all of the first generation, like Apple and all the first generation Microsoft operating systems, all did cooperative concurrency. And it worked fine for the time. And you might be thinking, well, did it work fine? Yes, it did. And the reason why it worked fine was because the hardware that was available at the time and the way that computers were used during that period, it wasn't a big deal. Because nobody could realistically run multiple things at the same time. We didn't have enough memory or enough CPU power. Disks were too slow for the swap. So it wasn't a big deal. And if you're running on some kind of restricted hardware, then you might consider cooperative concurrency as being an option. Um, but if you're running on a bit more powerful stuff, then obviously preemption is usually what we want. So on the topic of scheduling, this actually, one of the reasons why we need to know things like, are we doing uh, a real-time OS or not, is because when we decide upon the scheduling algorithm, that decision is going to impact our, our implementation of the scheduler. So are we going to support things like priorities or weights? Or are we going to dictate that every thread has the same priority? And what are the consequences of that? And we looked at CFS, which is Linux's completely fair scheduler. This is going to affect the selection of the quantum because CFS has the same quantum. Whereas uh, multi-level feedback queues, which are significantly more popular, we actually have several different scheduling quantums. And depending on the architecture, depending on your implementation, depending on whether you're real time or not, you may want those quantums to be different values. So that's a really interesting decision. There's other priority based scheduling. One of my favorites is the lottery scheduling algorithm. The lottery scheduling algorithm is super interesting. Actually, it's effectively what you're doing. And this is really high level. Um, each process or each thread gets a certain number of lottery tickets based on their priority. So a higher priority thread would get more lottery tickets. And then you do a random draw and whichever thread owns that ticket gets to go next. So probabilistically speaking, the higher, pri higher priority threads will get to go more often than the lower priority threads, although it is not a guarantee. But it's really easy to implement and it's kind of fun. Um, I, I really like the lottery scheduling algorithm. And then there's lots of others that you could do as well. Could you add priority to first come, first served? How would you do that? How would you modify that to include priority? And based on that, we also need to choose, of course, our scheduling quality. Then we have to ask questions about virtual memory. Now, again, this is really interesting because if you look at the older versions of things like Mac OS and, and Windows, they didn't do virtual memory to start with. So like DOS didn't use virtual memory. They didn't see the need to. And, and one of the reasons is because you could only run one program. I mean, I remember my first computer. I actually had a 1981 IBM PC. Now, admittedly, I didn't get it until the mid 90s, but that's a long story. Um, but how it ran, it didn't have a hard drive. So if you, you games either were or programs were either self booting kind of like Nintendo cartridges for like the old NES and the SNES or 
you had to put DOS in one drive, turn the computer on, and then DOS would boot, and then into the second drive you put your program and you load it. You couldn't load multiple programs. It was impossible to load multiple programs at the same time. You could only load one. So this concept of you know abstracting physical memory wasn't really a big deal because you didn't have multiple processes trying to share physical memory at the same time. Um, so it, are you going to use virtual memory? And um, if you do choose to use virtual memory, there's lots of decisions you have to make, um, such as what implementation are you going to use? Now, we looked at dynamic relocation, which had big fragmentation problems. We looked at segmentation, which was actually used in early Windows up until about um, Windows 95. So Windows 3.1 was the last of the 16-bit segmented, and I don't remember what Windows 95 used. Um, but it wasn't any... We know that segmentation is better than dynamic relocation, but at the same time, it does suffer from fragmentation problems. Now, why wasn't it a problem for Windows 3.1? Because again, even though you technically could load a couple programs at the same time, most people weren't. It just... There wasn't enough processing power. There wasn't enough memory. And disks were so horribly slow back then. I mean, they were bad. That the idea of actually having a feasible, let's run 100 Netscapes at once, that wasn't really possible. I mean, I remember doing it, like running one or two Netscapes at once, but it didn't really work that well. Um, and it was simply because it used too much resources and we just didn't have that many resources available to us and they were too slow. So on-demand paging was just too slow for this. Um, but when you went to Windows 95, it was a favorite game that some of us used to play on our, on our librarian was we would open up as many Netscapes as we could, all loaded to Hamster Dance. <laughs> if you don't know Hamster Dance, go look it up. The original Hamster Dance, which by the way is Canadian. It's one of the original memes. <laughs> and uh, so we load up like all these Netscapes until the point where the computer like couldn't run anymore and it would drive the library nuts. Things you do when you're bored in the 90s, all right? <laughs> so you've got to ask, if you're going to do virtual memory, how are you going to implement it? So dynamic relocation, probably not. Segmentation kind of works, but only under certain circumstances. And then there's paging which is what most operating systems use today. So for example, uh, Windows and Mac OS and Linux are using four level, multi, uh, four level paging. And the Linux kernel actually currently supports um, five levels with 57 vir bit virtual addresses, but you don't have to use. Um, and then there's the interesting combination of putting segmentation with paging, which is the bonus for assignment three. And why I kind of like that one, even though it's not that popular, one of the things that I personally really like about the combination of segmentation and paging is the fact that the page tables only contain valid addresses. Now, it's a bit more of a management nightmare, but at the same time, when you mix the two together, you get, like I said, the page tables only contain valid bits, which means that they are much smaller in general. So there's lots of things to think about for implementing virtual memory. Um, and some of those decisions have to come from what does your architecture support? This is why it's like the first thing on the list, because the architecture will have an MMU and the MMU will specify what it supports. Maybe the MMU only uh, supports segmentation. Maybe the MMU supports paging. Whatever the MMU supports, you're going to have to fall within that space. Um, and also deciding on you, which for implementation of virtual memory, how much memory is available? Um, and how many users or processes are anticipated? Because if you have one user and they're only going to run one program, then to be honest, segmented uh, address space, if it's supported, is actually quick and effective. So it's actually not a bad idea in that sense. And you also then have to think of what is the size of the program's address spaces. And this comes back to the decision, are you going to do address space preloading or on-demand paging? So if you have programs that have really large address spaces and you know that the memory in your system might be really small or you might be running more processes than your memory can support, then you're going to have to um, implement virtual memory with on-demand paging. Whereas if you're restricting the number of processes, 
um, you can actually take advantage of preloading, which is going to be the faster of the two. And then you have to discuss device drivers. So what kinds of devices are you going to support today? What ones are you going to support tomorrow? And how are you going to support these? So if you're doing a monolithic kernel, the tradition would be to make all device drivers loadable parts of the kernel and to have a default set of base drivers included with the kernel so that when somebody installs it on their computer, most of the devices already work. Um, now this question of what do you support today and what do you support tomorrow is devices are always changing. For example, so I have a big research machine that I use and the motherboard died on it. Well, parts of the motherboard are dead. And so I need to take it in and I need to get a replacement motherboard. But the motherboard is two years old or a year and a half old or something like that. So the question becomes, you know, if I take this in, am I going to get the same motherboard as before? Because it's two years old. They may not make them anymore. So I might be getting a different motherboard. So my devices might be changing. Yes, there are devices on your motherboard and your operating system needs to support that. Um, and so that can actually cause some interesting complications. So if you're going to support devices, which ones are you supporting today? And are you going to support updates to those drivers in the future? Um, and this comes down to how do you install devices? So one of the most common things today is plug and play. And when I was a kid, this did not work. This was so bad. I mean, I remember my first 486 was actually a Cirex 486. And you may have never heard of that brand. Um, but back in the 90s and 80s, there were a lot of knockoff chip manufacturers. So there was Intel and there was AMD which I think AMD started out off maybe as like an Intel knockoff, but there were other knockoffs. And one of the biggest competition to them was this uh, brand called Cirex. Um, and so I actually had a Cirex 486. It worked fine, but drivers, yeah. Plug and play just didn't work. So I had like, I put a Sound Blaster 16 in the, the computer and you would think that Windows at the time would be like, oh, Sound Blaster, Creative is the most common big name sound card manufacturer out there. It should just work. Windows should just be able to say, oh, I see you have a Sound Blaster 16. Here's the driver, except it didn't. And you had to download a driver uh, off the internet. And I only had like a 36, I had a 336K modem. I was on dial up. And the best download speed I ever got on that was 2K. Yeah, 2K. It sucked. <laughs> That's what happens when you have dial up in the country. It takes a week to download an MP3 or a driver. So, I mean, in the old days, plug and play didn't really work. And so every manufacturer actually shipped their device with a CD or a floppy disk with the actual drivers on them because they knew not everybody had access to quality internet or access to internet at all because it was, you know, in the mid nineties. And so everything was shipped with the driver. Things still ship with the driver today, but you don't usually use it. Like I get the driver disc for my my monitor here and I like laugh at it. It's like, why do I need this? Because plug and play works a lot better now. Now what happens is if your OS doesn't recognize it immediately and already have the driver for it, your operating system will go out and find it from its own database, which is really cool. So plug and play never used to work. It actually works reasonably well now. There's a few things I still have that are a little iffy. Uh, for example, my other monitor that's behind the green screen is, uh, it's a Samsung SA950. It's a 27 inch 3D screen, but they didn't use the standard 3D driver. So stereo 3D driver, they use, it's try something. It's a really bizarre driver. And it's almost impossible to get, and they want you to pay for it like a subscription fee. And it's it's just, it's really hard to get it to work. So, I mean, it's not perfect today, but plug and play generally works really well, unless you buy some kind of bizarre hardware. So if you were designing an operating system, what are you gonna support? Are you gonna have everybody manually install drivers, or are you gonna try to implement some kind of plug and play where you maintain a database of the most up-to-date drivers and include as many of them with the uh, kernel as possible. And another really, really interesting question is, are you gonna support legacy devices? If you look at macOS, if you look at Linux, 
kernel and if you look at Windows, you would be amazed at how much of the code base is actually dedicated to supporting legacy devices. So, like, I was in the Linux kernel there not too long ago, and I was looking at some of the devices they support, and it's like, nobody owns this device anymore. <laughs> but there's still support for it. So I'm, like, looking at, like, NVIDIA TNT2 Riva graphics cards. There's support for, like, Hercules graphics cards from the 80s. So my 1981 IBM PC actually had an, uh, an external graphics card. It had a Hercules graphics card which was like huge. Like if you think today's graphics cards were huge, the ones in the early eighties were bigger. I mean, they weren't as thick because they didn't need cooling, <laughs> but they were massive things, big, big things. Um, so are you, but why is Linux supporting this? Nobody uses a Hercules card. TNT two Rivas are from the late, they're from about, I bought mine in 2000, and then by 2002, 2003, it was so outdated. Like, I couldn't play Warcraft 3 on it, and that was a big deal because we were, instead of doing our schoolwork, instead of doing my OS work, I was doing, playing Warcraft 3 all day. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, are you going to support legacy devices? And you, if you do, which ones are you supporting? Um... I, I really think this is something that modern OSs need to start uh, killing, although a lot of people would complain about this. For, for example, so this thought about not supporting legacy devices. So one of the problems I actually have with Apple uh, is that um, when I made the switch to, I think it was Catalina, they dropped support for 32-bit applications. Now, most of you probably wouldn't think of that as a big deal. But it was a huge deal to me. And it was a huge deal to me because one of my primary programs that I use for my Stereo 3D research is only available on Mac in 32 bits. So I upgraded to Catalina because I was trying to, you know, keep my OS up to date, not realizing that they were dropping 32-bit support, and now my program doesn't work. So now I have to run Wine to get the 64-bit version of the Windows program to run on Apple. And it doesn't really work. Which is why tomorrow my computer will now be dual booted with another OS. <laughs> because I'm tired of this. Uh, but anyways, it's an interesting discussion. Are you going to support legacy hardware? Are you going to support legacy modes? Are you going to kill them? Apple takes the path of killing them and sometimes some people get left behind and get pretty angry. Um, Linux, I want to say, takes the path of let's support everything. But then your code base gets really messy. And let's be honest, who has a Hercules graphics card these days? Um, and then another question you have to ask is, which ways are you going to support communication with device registers? Now, this actually comes down to hardware dictating some of this for you. Because your hardware may only support port mapped I.O. Your hardware may only support memory mapped I.O. Your hardware may not have a DMA controller, and therefore DMA is not possible, and so you can only do large transfers by program control I.O. So your hardware does dictate some of how you communicate with device registers. Again, this is why you have to think about your architectures you're supporting when you're developing the actual kernel of the OS. And you have to think about, is this a portable OS or is this for a singular piece of architecture? So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting discussion. And if your hardware supports everything, are you in the kernel going to support all the options? Or are you going to restrict it to a few? It's your decision. It's, it's an interesting discussion. You really don't realize how much the architecture plays a role in the design of an OS until you actually start to try to develop one. And then you have to ask file systems. So are you going to support different file systems? Uh, Apple has taken the approach of let's only support certain file systems certain ways. <laughs> so for example, um, Apple lets you read from NTFS, which is the Windows Journal file system, but they don't let you write to it by default. Now, there are some little hacks or drivers you can get to let you write to NTFS, but even now, I can't write to NTFS without doing one of those little hacks, which is really, really annoying. Um, so some operating systems have taken the path of only supporting a subset of file systems, and other operating systems like Linux, other like the Linux kernel, actually supports like everything, right? Um, and 
the file systems you support is also going to dictate, you know, which kinds of secondary storage do you support. My 81 PC, uh, so it did not have a hard drive. Didn't. No hard drive. It had two floppy drives. Two. Um, and the other thing it had, which you probably have never seen, is a cassette player. <laughs> cassette deck. So, yeah, like it was a tape drive, like a regular, have you seen a cassette tape? It, it was program, your actual program disc was a cassette tape. So are you going to support cassette tapes and, and the behavior of cassette tape? Are you going to support tape drives? Because tape drives behave very, very differently from something like an SSD. So you've got to ask yourself, what kinds of secondary support? storage are you supporting and what kinds of file systems are you going to support? Um, and what is the file system that your OS is going to use by default? Are you going to have a virtual file system? So remember the virtual file system was the optional layer that takes multiple file systems and presents them to the logical file system as one unified thing. So in Windows that's having a two-part file system name, so the drive letter followed by the path name, and in uh, a, a Unix-based file systems, that's where you're mounting and unmounting the hierarchy trees temporarily to the, the default one. Um, so are you going to support that or are you going to do not support that? And if you're not supporting that, that that's probably fine in some cases. For example, if you have a single user system, and let's say it's a watch. So I have a little, uh, it's buried in one of my electronics boxes up on my desk here. I have a little Suntu, Suntu um, smartwatch. I mean, it's a smartwatch. It, it measures your heart rate. It's got GPS coordinates. It, it's got a compass and things like that in it. And it, it's somewhat useful. It doesn't make any phone calls, though. But it doesn't need to have a virtual file system in its operating system because it doesn't interact. It's You're not putting files on this thing. I mean, you can write programs for it, but you're not like plugging different USB sticks into it. So it doesn't need to support that. Um, and then you need to ask yourself, how are you going to handle caching? So if you're having secondary storage, typically speaking, you want to have some kind of cache um, that's um, maintained by the kernel for inodes and data blocks. And this is regardless of whether you're using a FAT-based file system or an NTFS file system. You're going to want to be caching some of the data. And how big is the cache? Where is the cache going to be stored? All, or are you going to utilize hardware like the Intel Optin to manage this cache? So there's lots of, of interesting discussions to be had there. Um, things like the Intel Optin, which is used for secondary storage caches, not currently really useful to consumers in my opinion but is really useful to industry. Um, and, but then again, you know, things change. <laughs> um, for me right now, I don't really find this to be a huge problem. So even though I'm using network attached storage, which is orders of magnitude slower than uh, if I actually had a hard drive in my laptop, um, it's still fast enough that I don't care. So I'm not going to be buying an Optane anytime soon. And then you have to ask, are you going to be supporting networking? So, um, and how is it going to be supported? Is this going to be completely hidden inside the kernel? So you need system calls. Um, are you going to support TCP? Are you going to support UDP? Are you going to support both of them? So which, what kinds of sockets are you going to support? Um, and is your operating systems kernel going to participate in any of the different protocols that are, are useful on the internet? Like, are we going to do any DNS caching? And you may be like, what's a DNS cache? Okay, so when you type into your little URL box, your nice texty URL, like amazon.com, um, the network doesn't know what that is. That That's nice human readable text. So DNS is like domain name, server's domain name, something. Uh, I can never remember what acronyms are. Um, and so what it is, is it's the service where before you actually talk to Amazon, you will talk to a DNS, you'll send a DNS request to, to the DNS server to ask, what is the IP address for Amazon.com? And the DNS server will respond to you with the IP address, and then you can talk to Amazon. Then you can actually make the request to Amazon. But you have to do that DNS lookup first. Now, some operating systems could actually include in the kernel a DNS cache, so that instead of having to go to your IP, your Internet Service, your ISP's um, DNS cache, 
um, which is like leaving your house and asking like tech savvy, hey, what's M- this the IP address for her, for uh, Amazon.com? It's it's uh, things you commonly go to could be cached in your computer, um, which is a good idea. And, and there's all kinds of other little tables um, like network address translation tables. That's for hiding you know your local network behind one external IP address. ARP, which is Address Res- Resolution Protocol, which is um, mapping IP addresses to the MAC addresses everything has like eight different names um and things like packet filtering packet filtering or firewalls um actually does tend to be a part of the kernel i know this is a part of the microsoft kernel um so you can actually like block uh packets coming from certain uh certain um, sources and that's that's actually supported right in the kernel but it doesn't have to be it's up to you you're designing the OS. And then you have to ask finally, what's my UI? Am I providing a UI? Is the UI a part of the kernel? Or is the UI a user program that uses system calls to attach to the kernel? Um, so is it user? Is it fully integrated or is it a user add-on? How does that work? Um, is it, If it's a desktop UI, you're gonna have to support certain devices, obviously. Um, are you gonna offer shells or any kind of terminal support? Uh, command line and how are you gonna handle performance? Because obviously if you're running on like the first Apple computer, the whole reason why they would have put the OS embedded on a chip was for performance issues. We don't tend to, with modern hardware, have that issue because, I mean, these new AMD Ryzen chips are pretty crazy, especially the laptop ones. They're, they knocked uh, Intel off, the plat- off their, uh, their horse. It's the Generation 9 laptop Ryzen's. Sorry, I'm trying to, and one of my laptops is broken. It's the one you can't see here that I'm watching on Twitch. And I'm trying to acquire a new laptop. But the Ryzen 9s keep, like, the second they're in stock, they are out of stock within, like, 20 minutes. And I'm never on the website in those 20 minutes where they are back in stock. So I'm sitting here waiting for these laptops to become available, and it's, it's really annoying. <laughs> All right. Then you have to ask, of course, what kinds of utilities, and this is more on the user side. Are you going to offer the kernel's application binary interface so that user programs can actually, you know, um, interact with the kernel? Um, are you offering any programming libraries like standard, the standard C library? Now, in a lot of operating systems, actually like Mac OS and, and Windows, you actually have to download this as like Visual Studio or Xcode, and it's kind of a pain. Um, I'm new Linux operating systems make the development environment much more seamless, I find. Um, getting this stuff to work on the other two can be a bit of a pain. Um, and then you've got, are you going to provide task managers? So things like Top or the Windows Task Manager, so that the user can actually see who's consuming all my resources and how do I get rid of them? Um, are you going to provide things like packet sniffers? And I showed you a packet sniffer in our last class, like Wireshark. Um, that's not a default part of Mac OS. That's something I downloaded. Uh, it's free, by the way. Um, are you going to offer network device configuration tools? Are they going to be text-based or are you going to provide a nice graphical UI for that? Um, are you going to provide system monitors? This is a big one that really irritates me. Like none of the operating systems really provide this by default. And I feel like it's such an essential service. I want to know the temperature of everything in my laptop. I know there are thermal sensors and I want to know the temperatures. So I want to know my CPU temperature. I want to know the ambient temperature. I want to know my GPU temperature. And if I have more than one, which I usually do, I want to know all of those temperatures. I want to know the fan speeds. I want to know the voltages. I want to know the disk traffic. I want to know the network traffic. I want to know all that information. And I usually have to download a program off the internet to actually get this to display even though it's the information is there. This is a tool I wish operating systems actually provided, um, which they don't tend to. And then are you providing any documentation and support? If you're writing an OS for yourself, you probably don't need to provide anything. <laughs> but if you're writing an operating system to sell or to release to the world, then you're going to need to consider documentation and support um, and make sure that it's well written. That's what technical writers are for. All right. So now I kind of want to go back over Temple OS and look at some of the design decisions that were made in this uh, operating system because they are very, very interesting. Um, 
So what's interesting is they did support multi-core processors, but I don't actually believe that they support things like PowerPC and MIPS. So it isn't as portable as uh, a, the Linux kernel or Microsoft, um, but it's, it does support multiple uh, multi-core processors. And it does have um, a concurrency. Uh, now, some reports said it was preemptive. Some reports say it's non-preemptive and it uses cooperative. Um, Again, because it's open source, there are variants of this out there. And I think there is a variant that does preemptive. But by default, Temple OS actually uses cooperative concurrency where programs have to yield, block, or terminate in order to share the CPU. Now, when we talk about kernel privilege, so I guess we should just say these design decisions here. So I think this is probably a good decision for them because this was never going to be an operating system that the world used. And given the simplistic nature of Temple OS, um, supporting preemptive concurrency might be a little too complicated. Um, now, as we said uh, in the beginning of the episode, I mentioned that everything runs with kernel privilege. So if you're looking at the rings of security, so on a typical modern machine, there are four rings of security. Um, so you've got ring zero, which is the kernel, ring one and two, which are typically reserved for device drivers, although not every system does this. Um, and then ring three, which is the outermost, is the least privilege, would be applications. Well, in Temple OS, everything runs in ring zero. Here is the advantage. No system calls. Super fast. You have direct access to everything in the kernel. You never have to make a system call. That's great. Think about everything that happens. A system call the user program has to use some kernel provided library to raise the exception. The exception gets picked up by the CPU. The CPU has to save the context of whatever was running. And then it has to figure out what kind of exception ran. Oh, it was a system call, which system call, and then run that. And then return from all of that. It's so much work. If everything runs in kernel privilege, there's no system calls. You just make a direct call to whatever function you want. You want a fork of process? Great. Call fork and you're done. It's great. Obviously, however, this offers no protection, which means that if a user program wants to directly access like password files or change directory structures, maybe maliciously, they can do that. Now, why wasn't this a big deal for Temple OS? Um, I mean, the reasons that I've read online have been that why would you desecrate the temple? But you know, when the, we create, when the internet was created, people were so excited about it that they never thought people would use the internet maliciously. So a lot of the original networking protocols that we still use today actually are really, really flawed in terms of security. Like the email protocol doesn't validate that the sender of the email is actually the person sending the email, which is why you can do email spoofing and you can very easily write a little Python program to have you pretend to be Bill Gates, email the president of the university saying I'm donating X million dollars. It, it's like three lines of code. It's so easy to spoof it. And it's because the original internet protocols were never designed with security in mind because they never thought people would use the internet maliciously because it's such a great thing for humanity. Why would anybody use it for bad purposes? And the same problem comes here. This operating system was designed thinking no one would ever do anything malicious in this OS. So why would we ever do security? Now, admittedly, it probably isn't a big deal because nobody actually uses this as an operating system day to day that I know. I mean, maybe there is a few people out there, but this is more of a toy. Now, a really bizarre design decision was that all the programs share a single address space. So there's no isolation between different processes. <sighs> this is difficult because, I mean, it's nice because every process can talk to every other process. So you don't have to use anything special. You can just access memory in the other process. But then you come up with security issues, you come up with synchronization issues. This is not something we should probably be permitting. So without the isolation, if I create 30 IFV tanks in Red Alert 2, it's the anti-aircraft tank, um, 
I don't want it to actually use money from my bank account. But because they haven't, because it's a shared single address space and we have no isolation, that could happen. So there are negative sides, there are positive sides in that processes can easily communicate with each other. So if you wanted to make map reduce, the processes can actually share the results with each other directly without system calls. So there is some advantage and some disadvantage. This is a very peculiar design decision though. And um, it makes the code quite interesting. The other thing is there's no real virtual memory. So even though the 64-bit architecture that this was built for does require paging, so it does use an MMU, Temple OS had to therefore you create a page table system. So again, this is where the architecture is dictating a design decision to the OS because the architecture uses a paged MMU, the OS must do something for that. So how Temple OS handled the fact that they didn't want virtual memory, but the architecture was dictating they needed it, is they do have a virtual page table, but it just maps the virtual page to the physical page. So it's an identity mapping. So if you have virtual page number seven, it maps to physical frame seven. So it's a one, <laughs> it, it's a literally an identity map. Um, and that's how a Temple OS handled that architectural restriction for their design. Um, so effectively, all program addresses are real physical addresses. And again, if you're not worried about security, it's actually not that big of a deal. Um, now, they don't actually need page tables. It's just whenever there's a page fault, um, it just writes the identity to the TLB. So that, that makes things really easy. Um, and again, no security. You can find any program data you want um, because you have a single address space. Everybody's just using the physical memory straight up. So you can access every program's data, read it and write it. So bad security, but easy communication. Now they have no networking. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that decision probably makes sense. Um, they do round Roblin scheduling and each I mean, so round robin scheduling, so there's no no one thread has more priority than any other. Round robin scheduling, by the way, is exactly what uh, OS 161 uses. It's the advantage, it's very simple to implement. No thread will ever starve. So why not do that? Very easy. Um, now, what is a more modern idea is that because this supports multiple core processors, they have one ready queue per core. So that's actually, it's pretty good. And you might be thinking, well, is this, are we going to have load balancing issues? Uh, I don't think so. Temple OS isn't really something where I can, because it uses cooperative concurrency, I don't really see, and, and the way that it's designed, I don't really see you running like 100 programs at the same time. That just doesn't make sense. Um, now, the graphical, the, the actual interaction using the 8-bit graphical display. Again, this isn't a big design decision in terms of the kernel. This is just, this is how we wanted to present the interface to you. Um, it's no different than somebody deciding to give you like just a terminal to interact with something. Um, this is going to make it so that even if somebody wanted to port this to other architectures or make it more compatible with uh, modern programs, this is going to be very restricting because a lot of programs are not designed to run in VGA mode. True story. I actually wrote code last night to convert images to this exact color space. Yeah, that was fun. It's a uh, VGA 16 color is like a... Uh, it's it's a indexed color system and I'm using it for segmentation <laughs> um, now one of the more interesting design decisions he made also was supporting di different file systems so he's v the OS temple OS is very isolationist I want to say it's very much its own self-contained temple like no networking um, Nothing is isolated from each other. Everything can share. But I did find it a little bit peculiar that it supports several different file systems. So it supports FAT32, which is the older Windows 32-bit file system, um, which pretty much every device supports. It's really easy to support. And it also supports um, some of these other file systems here. And this is probably so that he can interact with his other computers more easily. 
Um, and then Red C, which uses, it's a blockchain. So it's very similar to FAT32. What's interesting is it doesn't allow files to grow. And instead of using a table, um, it uses an allocation bitmap. So this is incredibly restrictive. So once you create a file, that file is not allowed to grow. So you create a file, it has size X, it can never grow beyond size X. That's gonna be, let's say you're writing a document and you get an initial size for the document, you can't grow that document. Um, so, so that offers you, a, that's really restrictive. Uh, now, I mentioned it was written in this language called Holy C, which is its own version of the C language, and I said that it was kind of interesting itself. Um, so just some interesting features of Holy C. Uh, the, what's interesting is the top level gets executed when you compile. So anything that exists at the top level will be executed on compilation. There is no main function, and it's JIT compiled. Now, many of you may not be familiar with this term JIT. This means just in time. So what that does is, um, so just in time means that we are only going to compile and execute code at the point where we reach that line. And there are advantages to JIT compilation. Um, I worked on an OpenGL JIT compiler for a vector DSP, fancy piece of MIPS hardware, um, many, many years ago. And we were able to achieve a speed up of 300 times faster um, using a JIT OpenGL compiled just in time. So that, that was really interesting. Now you might be wondering, why could it be faster? And it's because you know the current state of the system because you're, it's during execution. And so when you're compiling, your optimizations can be for the current existing system. And you don't have to generate always as much assembly code. So it's, it's kind of, a, it's an interesting, it's interesting. <laughs> um, so there's support for reflection in class, and there's classes, which is not something C has. C has structs, but no classes. This has classes with reflection. And the other interesting thing is that the symbol table is accessible during runtime. So you don't need environment variables. Um, you can just access the symbol tables for any program. So you can think of it as when you load the program code into the address space, there is a symbol table loaded into the beginning of the code segment, and you can just access things in that symbol table in the OS. So that's kind of cool, actually. That's a, that's a really neat, bizarre feature. And again, there's another picture of it. So with that, that is actually the end of everything we have for CS350. I hope that... Um, even though this has been an online term, I hope that the course has been enjoyable and I hope you learned something and I hope you had a little bit of fun and uh, hopefully we'll see each other in person at some point in the future. So this is me signing off for the term. Um, good luck with the final assessment. I'm sure you'll all do just fine.